A of Patrick Pindaro here, co-founder at Vetted Biz. Very excited to have on today Eric Stites, who is the CEO and founder of Franchise Business Review. He founded the company 17 years back and really has led the way um, for surveys, feedback, input from franchisees, and has worked with hundreds of franchise brands that are expanding in the U.S. and internationally. Um, Eric, thanks so much for joining today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. So you've been in the franchise industry for some time. It'd be great if you could just uh, recap how you entered into the franchising space and then what the impetus was for Franchise Business Review. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, it seems obvious today when you think about review sites, all the different, you know, from Glassdoor to Yelp to Amazon, all the different sites that are out there. Um, but 17 years ago, uh, you know, there was nothing like this in the franchise space. And so we were really working. Um, I had been with a number of franchise marketing companies and helping, you know, them reach out to franchise candidates. Um, but, you know, everybody wanted to know, you know, the same sorts of questions. Is the training good? Is the support good? Are you making any money? Um, and so we kind of came up with this idea of, you know, surveying franchise owners and, and asking those questions, because as you're probably well aware, you know, existing franchise owners get calls every day from people that might want to buy into the business. Um, and obviously they're busy running their own business, so they can't always return those phone calls. So we, we came up with the idea of doing this. We were um, actually working with Duncan Brands at the time, um, who had great validation with their franchisees but again busy business owners didn't want to call for well, yeah i mean candidates. the average duncan franchisee i imagine has like 10 20 plus units yeah they're not, yeah they're, and they're out on the road running from restaurant to restaurant they don't have time to call back people that are thinking about buying a franchise so um you know that it everybody thought it was a great idea but then they were like well it would have to be third party like you know and so i was working uh for a marketing company at the time um, who was actually being acquired and they were thinking about having everybody sign a two-year non-compete to stay with the company. And so the timing was just good for me to leave and kind of start this on my own. And so, you know, I started calling everybody I knew in the franchise industry and, you know, said, we want to survey your franchisees and share that information with candidates. And for the most part, everybody thought I was crazy. <laughs> Is it just because they thought like the collection aspect would take a long time or? Yeah, what, no, that think was, you were crazy? I think they were more concerned about what their franchisees might actually say. Um, That's a problem. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So it's interesting. Um, you know, we spent about a year trying to figure it out. Um, we knew, you know, one thing that we definitely knew is that franchise companies were very competitive. So we came up with the idea of doing awards uh, based on satisfaction. And in the next two months after announcing our first awards, we had about 150 brands participate in that process. And then it just kind of grew from there. Um, you know, I guess the, the biggest, you know, pivot is a very popular term these days with the whole, you know, COVID crisis, yeah. but our, our early pivot was really in, in, it was originally designed as just a franchise development tool to help facilitate that. that More sales. on the sales side saying, okay, here are the testimony. These are the, right. the input right. from all these franchisees. Yeah. And, we, and is it the good and bad? Like, are you surveying, are, uh, will yeah, the we survey, franchisees voice be heard or? Yeah, we survey everybody. I mean, that's part of the process. And, you know, what we quickly realized is it was, you know, really an operational tool first. Um, you know, two thirds of the companies that we surveyed didn't have great validation with their franchisees at the time. Um, and, you know, times have also changed significantly where I think a lot of franchisors are much more sophisticated today um, due to, you know, private equity coming in and a whole host of other reasons. Um, back then it was kind of the wild west of, you know, selling franchises and, not everybody was that great at supporting franchises. So, yeah, service you know, them after after you right. uh, sell the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely changed a lot, and it's been fascinating to watch that in the industry. You know, um, you know, the fr I love franchising. You know, there's there's great opportunities out there, and you know, some that are not so great. But you yeah. know, that's that's what makes it interesting. It seems like the top companies are really open to feedback and improving. And I'm sure your your surveys help a lot. And then also just they're more like almost technology companies where right. 
Right. They're yeah. I mean, when you, so much on the tech stack. For, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that you think about like, you know, again, going back 17 years ago, you know, the tools that we think of today that everybody uses, whether it's Slack or, you know, other um, tech tools in your business. I mean, those things didn't exist. And so, you know, the feedback loop from franchisees is, is critical and, you know, helping candidates understand that in the validation process, but also helping the brands understand that operationally to, to, you know, kind of move the needle and help their franchisees be more successful is, is, you know, really what, what drives us today. So, so the first time that you had this like uh, massive uh, inbound of, of franchisors and conducted the surveys and roughly two thirds, you know, had, had pretty big issues. Like what right. were some of the findings um, the, on the operational side that franchisees were upset with that the franchisor could address? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think the biggest factor is that there's, there's, and it still exists to some extent today, there's often a disconnect between the franchise development team and the franchise operations side of the house. And so, you know, naturally we all like to talk about, you know, our best case scenarios and, you know, this franchisee is hitting it out of the park and, you know, bought 10 units and everything else. But you know, that may not be the average experience for the, the typical franchisee in the system. So I think it's really important that the development team and the operation team are on the same page and that you, you know, don't certainly oversell. And I think that's where franchising as an industry has, you know, done a lot of that in the past where not that they've, you know, you know, they're not, they're not, uh, <laughs> you know, selling sunshine and rainbows all day long, but you know, it, it, it often seems a lot easier than it really is. And as you know, as everybody that owns a business knows, you know, small business ownership is hard. And you yeah, know, the first two years is our grind. If you're not yeah, willing to yeah. put that time and, in, you know, and I don't care if you're starting, you know, Mike's donuts or Pat's donuts, or, yeah. you know, you're buying into Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be a grind. And so, you know, I think that that's where, a lot of people get attracted to franchising thinking, I want to own my own business, but I don't want to work that hard. And so franchising has it all figured out. And, you know, franchising has a proven model for the most part, but it's still a lot of work. So I think that, you know, having candidates really understand that, you know, it does take time. I, I think the other um, aspect of business ownership that challenges all franchise companies is that, individuals that are looking to be self-employed, they all, you know, everybody has friends that own businesses and, you know, are successful and make money and they might own a boat or, you know, play golf three times a week. But what they don't necessarily see is the, you know, 10, 15, 20 years that individual, you know, really invested in that business to get to that, you know, lifestyle uh, today. And so, you know, a lot of people, you know, they just want that lifestyle today and they don't want to necessarily put in the grind. And so I think that's the, that, that I think franchise companies have gotten much better at explaining that, you know, business is hard work. And, and so, you know, you really need to understand, you know, and we can help you. I mean, you know, obviously franchise companies are very good at helping with those kind of aspects to make them a little easier, but at the end of the day, you're still the business owner and have to implement. That's well said. And when you started FBR franchise business review, 17 years back, I'm, I'm sure most of the time it was the franchise or themselves selling the opportunity. And then right. at the same office and without this work from home and remote world we're in today, they were, <laughs> right, right. they were together, or I'm sure the operations folks were on the road too, but they right. were generally physically together. We're now work from home, remote work, and then also franchise sales organizations that right. are essentially outsourced um, sales efforts for franchise. Yeah. Outside sales teams, brokers, you know, there's lots of people that quote unquote represent franchise brands today. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, candidates come in and become franchisees and then it's the ops team's problem to support that person where I think, you know, the best organizations are doing a much better job of, you know, having operations involved very early on in that sales process mm. to educate candidates and to, validate you know it should be person. like one step like after the second call or third call yeah exactly i mean we just came back from the ifa conference the international franchise association conference and it was amazing how many 
people I spoke to at different roundtables where their, you know, their operations team has veto power, so to speak, on any new candidate coming into the system, which is, you know, great. Again, it's not just, you know, bringing in anybody that can write a check. I mean, obviously, these brands know who's successful in their systems, what skills it takes, you know, how much money you really need to have to, to be successful. And so to have operations, you know, at the table, let alone have, you know, that veto power is, is great. Yeah, that's that a great initiative. That didn't exist 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's long-term incentives are aligned because, I mean, if the franchisor is making most of their money on the royalties as opposed to the franchise fee, that's recurring revenue. And right, right. one day they do want to sell to a private equity fund or IPO, the valuation is going to be significantly higher if they have right. this recurring revenue model as opposed to selling franchises, 20, 30% of them close the first couple of years. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, there's so many stories of brands that sold, you know, to people that could afford to buy the franchise, but didn't necessarily have the skill set to run it. And, you know, and now they've got these big territories that are taken up by, you know, average or lower performing franchisees. And so to be able to, you know, really understand, I mean, that's the thing when I, I tell people, when you're looking at a franchise brand, um, you should feel like, you know, it's a recruitment process mm -hmm. and they, sh they should be analyzing you as a candidate just as much as you're analyzing them. And if it feels more like a sales process, then you're probably in the wrong place. That's well said. I mean, some of the best franchises, they don't even really recruit or they're just hiring from within like Domino's Pizza, right. uh, Dutch Bros Coffee. They're not there. You have to already be in the ecosystem and probably would have had to be already an employee, a manager to even be considered to, to be a, uh, awarded a franchise license. Right. Right. Yeah. Now there's, you know, again, it's, it, it should be a process just like the franchise operations process. And, you know, if you feel like you're being sold some smoke and mirrors, then you probably are. And how do you see it in terms of like hours worked earnings? Cause I've seen some of the reports you've, you've shared on your site that that have some pretty interesting insights in terms of how much money franchisees are actually making or how many hours right. they're actually working, which the hours worked seem much higher than I would have uh, anticipated. Yeah. I mean, again, it, it varies significantly from, you know, there's a lot of owner operators um, that, that just have one location, one business. Um, and then there's lots of multi-unit owners that have an, a whole organization or a team to support those units. So you know, it is, I mean, for, and it, you know, obviously franchising goes across lots of different industries. So, you know, if your dream is to own a business and make $50,000 a year and work 20, 30 hours a week, you know, there's, there's franchises that you can do that with. If you're, you know, looking more for, you know, to own multiple locations and build an empire, you know, you're, you're probably, you know, you can do that and make hundreds, if not millions of dollars, but you know, you're going to need a much bigger infrastructure and a team around you. And, you know, you'll probably be working more like, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week and <laughs> not 20 and hours. use leverage, sign personal guarantees. Yeah. 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 If you're, if you're reading the four hour work week and you're thinking about buying a franchise, it's probably not a good fit. <laughs> That's well said. Yeah. We do see a lot of that um, comments and, and feedbacks for like semi-absentee passive opportunities and the reality is capital is super cheap right now in the US. You know, yeah. you can get a SBA loan for five, six percent. And if if it's that easy to run the business, these businesses would just be opening up tons of corporate units and uh right. Right. have managers in place. And but it it the reality yeah. is it's I mean, not. Yeah, it's so people dependent, obviously. So if you've got a great team of people and you know you can plug them into XYZ franchise model to operate, you know, yeah, you can be an absentee owner and investor in that and, and be successful, but, you know, you're only going to be as successful as your team. And so, you know, like you said, I mean, if it were that easy, you know, there wouldn't be franchising the corp, they would just, you know, every store would be a corporate location, um, but they know it's very people specific. And how does, how does your process work? Like, does the franchise or en engage you directly or how does it work if, there's a lot of franchisors that subscribe to our podcast and watch our videos. If, if they don't, if they're in the learning mode and they're, they're happy to get the feedback and they're going to act on it 
How can right. they start this survey process with you guys? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So, you know, when we started, you know, we wanted it to be, you know, open to every brand out there. So we, and we still offer that any, any brand can participate in our survey process at no cost. Oh, wow. Um, to be eligible for the award. So they don't, you know, as, as part of the, you know, quote unquote free model, they don't get the full data of the survey, but they, they can be eligible for the awards list. They'll get an overall score um, against our benchmark. And so that's a lot of companies will start there, but okay. you know, again, more established brands um, really usually come to us first from an operational standpoint, because they, they want to know how they're doing. Um, and, and many organizations today will be serving their franchisees at, you know, internally. So it's, it's unique that someone's never surveyed their franchisees, um, but they want, you know, our benchmark data to know how, how they compare to other systems that are out there and then how they can, you know, improve. And that's really, you know, the benchmarking data and kind of the best practices that we can provide to go along with that is the, you know, the value that we bring to the table. That's well said. And in terms of the benchmarking, like besides hours work for franchisees, what are some of the most important metrics that you're, you're collecting and then benchmarking for franchisors? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question. And, and, you know, I mean, the most important, I think, question in our survey is, do I trust my franchisor? Um, <laughs> you know, we have, there's 33 questions in there um, that are standard. And then we ask a lot of custom questions too, but, um, and we've got the, you know, would you recommend my franchisor? But, you know, franchising is all about trust at the end of the day. And so franchisees, that have a, a good relationship, positive relationship with their franchisor, and they trust that the you know the franchise team is really taking the brand in the right direction. Um, you know that's a, a big component. And you know if you're working with a franchisor that's you know everything is kind of this is the way we do it, and we don't want to hear your opinion and just do it this way. Um, you know those those that used to work kind of in the old days, but now certainly. Uh, you know, it's, it's very much a franchisee, franchisor, uh, you know, kind of partnership, if you will. The, the, the lawyers don't like to, uh, you know, use the term partnership, but, um, you know, certainly that's the way uh, the most successful brands operate is they, they see their franchisees as true business partners and they engage them in that way. And if you don't trust your business partner, I mean, that's going to make it pretty rocky. Right, right. Constantly yeah, and looking it's, your sho- over your shoulder and... Right. And it's, it, you know, and it's hard. And, you know, when you think about any business, especially in the franchise industry, I mean, when, when a new brand comes out and they've got 10, 15, 20 locations, you know, they're operating very differently. And then, you know, they might start franchising and grow, you know, to a hundred or several hundred units in a few years. And so, you know, under their, I mean, who their candidates are, are going to change that profile of the ideal candidates going to change over that time. But how they operate um, also changes. And so it's, I think that's a hard thing for a franchisee coming in, especially if you come into a new system where you might have, you know, day-to-day interactions with the CEO of the the founder of the brand. And then the system, you know, gets larger and larger and larger. And suddenly you never hear from the CEO anymore. You're talking to a field support person or somebody lower down the chain of command. That that can be hard for for folks. but I think the brands that do it right, you know, they, they have that team in place to really engage franchisees and, and treat them as true business partners. So in terms of all these franchisees, I mean, there's some systems you're surveying that have 50, 100, 200. How do you make sure that they participate in the survey so that there's some minimal threshold right. that's hit in terms of franchisees that are responding? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I don't know how many franchisees you've met um, but generally speaking, they like to share their feedback and speak their mind. So, <laughs> I mean, we average a 70% response rate with most of the brands that we survey, um, obviously a little bit lower for some of the biggest brands that are out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, when franchisees realize that, realize that we're a third party and, and, you know, we're doing this from a operational perspective first and foremost, um, you know, getting them to participate is, is pretty easy. And is it Uh, private? Could it be used against them in some bad way? How does that work out? Yeah. By default, it's anonymous. Um, if they choose to share their identity, they, they can, um, in most many, 
about 50% will share their identity. Um, and, you know, it's just a great tool to help build that relationship with their operations support team. Um, so that, again, you know, if it's general feedback um, that's going to help the brand, that's great. But if it's some specific issue that you're having in your local market, obviously by sharing your identity, it helps the, get the support team. Yeah, it can be addressed. And so, you know, and I think that's what, you know, most, you know, franchisees feel that if they have a specific issue they they want to share their identity. And, um, you know, I, I think many of those issues are probably not, uh, you know, new items to the, to the franchise team, but, you know, it is amazing that, uh, I mean, we, we survey clients uh, or have surveyed brands all the time and all of them say, you know, we learned so much from this that, you know, we didn't know before. And, and that's really where the value comes is that as a third party, they will share information with us that they may not share or, or may not get back to the top levels of the management team at the brand. Any advice for like a franchise founder or CEO that's managing the sales team, managing the operations, um, any advice to that? CEO founder who's looking to really grow their franchise system in a sustainable way? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, I, I always say, you know, first of all, go slowly. I mean, because it's a lot easier to, you know, make little mistakes and undo them than to go fast and make big, big mistakes. And so, you know, obviously invest in a couple of locations yourself, make sure that, you know, it works in different markets. Um, and then as you start to franchise and, and get into different markets, you know, really listen to the franchisee um, and, and understand because, you know, you, you run into situations where, you know, the model may be proven, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it's got nuances in different markets, whether it be the size or geography or, you know, I mean, even big brands like Dunkin' Donuts, you know, when they went from New England, which was kind of their stronghold down into the south, um, you know, people don't drink as much coffee down South. They drink a lot of iced tea and, you know, little nuances like that really can change the brand. So, you know, listen to the franchise owners and, and understand what their experience is and, you know, and really work with them to be successful. Um, and, you know, I think the biggest and the hardest thing for a new franchisor is especially, you know, reinvesting in the brand to build up that operations and support team before you need it. Um, because, uh, you know, if you do it the other way around and you sell a whole bunch of franchises, but you can't support those franchisees, they're going to be unhappy. They're not going to validate the brand. You know, it's going to stall franchise development going forward. So you really got to scale up your support team and make that. Imagine investment. there's like a six month, uh, training process to get a franchise operations person up to speed. Cause you can't yeah. just have someone come in and the next week, Oh, go train this person to do that. Right, right. No, it's, it's true. And, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of, I think, kind of middle road brands, you know, if you look at their operations and field support people, they, they're really young, you know, quote unquote, kids out of college, whatever it may be, you know, who, that's an important thing, especially as a franchise candidate is, you know, who's providing that day to day support? Um, and what's their experience? And, and if you've got, somebody that has been with the brand for six months and doesn't know business and doesn't know your local market, you know, you're, that really is not all that helpful. So, I mean, some of the best, I, th some of the best brands I've seen have really taken um, existing franchisees that have, you know, really been successful in their system and, and rotated them through mm. um, support. So, um, you know, again, sometimes they sell their units and, and come to the corporate team. Sometimes they find, you know, somebody on their team to manage General those manager units. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but having that experience is really, really critical. The culture um, too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and, and it's, again, it's really about understanding that operational component of, you know, and coaching that franchisee versus, you know, coming in with your clipboard and saying, Oh, the bathroom's dirty. And, you know, you, you got to build that relationship, um, you know, from the ground up and, and have it be about business success, not, you know, checking off the, the checklist. <laughs> and I've met a few franchise systems where their head of development or a development manager was in operations for like two or three years. 
Right. And then went into the, the front office sales of, of yeah. the organization. I think that's right. pretty powerful. Yeah, that I think that speaks wonders for a brand when you've got that kind of background. And, you know, and if you see franchise development people that also own some of the units themselves, that's, you know, speaks volumes of the brand too. So like, again, you, you know, what's, what's your skin in the game? <laughs> exactly. Well, that's great, great advice for franchisors. Maybe concluding, how about a franchise buyer? There's a lot of information out there. There's good information, bad information, right. uh, consultants, brokers. There's a lot of uh, intermediaries right. in this franchise lots, space. Lots of people to give you advice, right? <laughs> exactly. But I'd love to hear from you where you actually have all this data on the franchisee reviews and right. what's important for someone that's looking to buy a franchise. Yeah, it's great. Uh, great question. Because, you know, as I said, I mean, understanding, you know, that broad experience with franchisees in, in any system is, is critical. So, you know, you want to talk to, I mean, whether you download some of our reports, you still want to talk to as many franchisees as you can um, and understand that you're going to run into a variety of different experiences. So you, you may call a franchisee and catch them on a bad day and they may be, you know, really aggravated about xyz about the brand and and you know and and if you're going to just run into that but if you run into that a lot that's obviously a red flag and so really understanding you know what what are your strengths as a candidate and and where are you going to have to hire to make up for you know some of your challenge areas and how's how's the you know how does that match up with the skills that it takes to be successful in a brand and again, in those areas that maybe not an expert area of expertise for yourself, how does the brand, you know, coach you through that? So, you know, maybe you're strong in operations, but, you know, not so good in sales and marketing. And so what, what does the brand provide to help support you in that? And then validate that with the franchisees as far as, you know, are the marketing programs as good as they say they are? Are the, you know, sales programs as good as they say they are? Um, and again, you're going to get a variety of answers from, from different franchisees, depending on the day, <laughs> but, you know, if the majority are, you know, somewhat positive, um, that's generally a good sign. And, you know, and, and you can obviously see this when you're looking at a franchise disclosure document in, in item 20, you know, how quickly are they growing? How many units have they maybe closed over a period of time? And so acquired by the franchisor. Yeah. So, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, there's when you talk to franchisees, how long have they been with the system? You want to, you know, talk to some newer franchisees. New franchisees are great at asking questions about training and support because they've most recently come through that, that, that program and it's fresh in their memory. Um, but you also want to talk to some more mature, you know, franchisees that have been with the brand five, 10 plus years. Um, and if you, you know, in your due diligence, can't find any of those mature franchisees, if it's all newbies, that's a, you know, certainly a red flag too. Um, but, you know, I find that franchisees, you know, like I said, they, they tell it like it is, they want to help candidates, um, because they were in, in their shoes, you know, not long ago. And, and they will tell you the truth, the good, the bad, the ugly. And, you know, I think if you're realistic and, you know, apply, uh, you know, apply your good skill set, uh, you'll be successful too. I'm sure that franchisees don't want to like over embellish an opportunity because this guy might sign up for the franchise system and now he's on a Slack chain and they're communicating monthly and they see each other every <laughs> right, year. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you talk to franchisees, like I said, you're always going to talk to franchisees that are unhappy and you want to kind of dig into that and find out why. And, you know, is it a, you know, is it an issue that's systemic with the brand? Is it just something, you know, that this person is, you know, unique to that market um, and, and understand, you know, and address that certainly with the franchisor too. So like if somebody or a bunch of people say, you know, marketing is, you know, not easy to implement or whatever it may be, you know, talk to the franchise or about that and hear what, what their feedback is. And again, everybody's experience and expertise and skill set is a little bit different. So, um, but generally speaking, the franchisees do, do clearly tell it like it is. And, and if they know that you're a serious candidate and see that you have the right skill sets, you know, they'll be welcoming of, you know, in, in, you know, ask them, you know, would, would you do this again? 
um, knowing I what like you that. know today. Would you do this again? And then what was the other one? Do you trust your franchisor? Do you trust the franchisor. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and, and that's, uh, you know, obviously an important thing. It's a long-term, you know, franchising like a marriage. It is, it, you know, it's a 10, 15, 20 year marriage in some cases. So, um, you know, and understand that broad vision of the franchisor as well as what, you know, where they see the brand going as, as we kind of talked about, you know, private equity has gotten involved. Um, so you may hit your wagon to a brand and, you know, private equity might come in after that and that could change things. Um, a new management team might come in and that could change things. So, you know, that's part of franchising and being, you know, flexible. And certainly, you know, you hope that that's a good thing for the brand. They're going to invest in new systems or leverage other systems from other brands they may own. Um, but it's important to kind of know that, you know, that franchise relationship is, is a long-term relationship. So trust is a key component. And it's starts starting like, understanding like the franchisee too you're talking about and like are they having a bad day but like it, ideally diving a little bit into their background like i talked to the founder of a franchise system where his most important criteria is they're not awarding franchise licenses to entry level folks graduating college they right. want you to already have success in your career over the last five to ten years so right right if there's a franchisee that signed up and he's not doing well and he's has kind of struggled throughout his career and has bounced around a lot of different jobs and has never really hit his stride yet. Right. And that's something that you should, you should be mindful of when you talk to that, that franchisee. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, the other piece too is, you know, we, we've got lots of companies on our awards list that are great companies, but you know, every company has got a different culture, different personalities within their brand. And so, you know, just because a company is well rated by us or, or some other source, you know, doesn't mean that you're a natural fit for that company. Um, so when you talk to franchisees, like you want to understand, are these the types of people, you know, that I want to hang out with? Because, you know, those are the most successful franchisees are, you know, working with their other franchisee, their co-franchisees in their system, and they're getting together multiple times a year, and they're sharing lots of information and best practices. And, you know, if these aren't the type of people that you want to have a cup of coffee with or hang out at the bar with after a conference, you know, maybe you should, you know, look at a different look at another company. system. There's like 2000 plus franchises available. Right, right, exactly. Well, Eric, this has been great. We're definitely gonna leave your contact information a link to your website. Um, is there any other information you'd like to, to conclude with? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you can look me up on LinkedIn or uh, at the contact information below. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> You know, check out franchisebusinessreview.com and uh, feel free to reach out with any questions anybody has, whether you're a franchisor or a candidate or somebody in between. Perfect, Eric. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks.